Welcome to What is Going Om for new thought from the edge of Om. Each week on Om Times flagship radio show, veteran broadcaster, author, and media consultant Sandy Sedgbeer conducts thought provoking interviews with inspirational authors, artists, musicians, scientists, speakers, and filmmakers who are working at the point where spirituality and science meet consciousness at the very edge of Om. Here is your host, Sandy Sedgbeer. Hello. It's often said that we cannot buy happiness. Nonetheless, millions of us invest an awful lot of time, energy, hope and money, believing that we have to do something, buy something, overcome something or awaken something in order to attain happiness and contentment in life. But what if the answer to finding peace, harmony and freedom were as simple as having a dialogue with yourself? Ray Brooks is a British author, musician, recording artist and a public speaker on the subject of non-duality who travels the world speaking about his direct experience of our true nature through simple self-inquiry. The author of the book Blowing Zen, Finding an Authentic Life, Ray Brooks joins me tonight to discuss his latest book, The Shadow That Seeks the Sun, which chronicles his lifelong search for joy, happiness and wholeness and the answers he found through an unexpected encounter with an extraordinary Anglo-Indian man on the ghats of the sacred river Ganges. Before we start, a word of warning. If your experience listening to Ray Brooks tonight is anything like the experience I had with him earlier this week, be prepared to not only have many thoughts and beliefs challenged, but also for your mind to experience some moments of complete and utter emptiness. Ray Brooks, welcome. Oh, thank you for such an introduction. <laughs> Ray, let's go back to the beginning. Tell us about your earlier days in England and at what point you became aware of a deep need to find something. Ah, oh, good question. Yes, I was brought up in a city called Newcastle by my grandmother and um, she developed dementia and I was allowed to come and go as I pleased. I had a really good childhood because I could do anything I wanted but she did love me when she could remember who I was. But um, From there I started challenging the school system and my beliefs that I was taught heavy, the, the religious instruction I was giving. And then my grandmother um, died. She fell down the stairs, unfortunately. And I was shipped to London to live with my mother. Um, and that was the start of the story. What do you think it was within you that prompted you to be challenging everything? I mean, do you think that there was always this um, this space within you that knew there was something that you hadn't yet found? Um, you know, when I was in London and I was going to all the nightclubs and pubs and seeing my friends and I had everything I wanted, you know, I, I, I felt as though that there was something missing and alcohol didn't do the trick and and relationships didn't do it, cars, or all the things that we find we think gives us happiness. None of it gave me happiness. And I had nowhere to turn. Um, so I started questioning what it was all about. And there was one night, I was really working hard at the time too. There was one night I was in a nightclub. I, I write this in the book. I was in a nightclub and I don't know whether it was exhaustion or well, it, it must have been partly overworked, but I had what would be considered a transcendental experience. From that, when I left the nightclub, the next day, it wasn't there, but I wanted to question. I started questioning, well, what is this? What happened to me? And I started to see that there must be something else than the way I was living. And I actually left London. 
Was was that experience completely natural, or was it fueled by drugs or something, alcohol? I know. I had I'd had a couple of pints in the pub, you know. I mean, I'm, but I was I, 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 two pints was nothing back in those days, and um, it was just an ordinary night. But I had been working nights um, in the in the vaults of the Bank of England. Actually, we were putting in a, a wiring system there. So and perhaps it tiredness. Been, it was tiredness, but it, it really didn't matter what it was. It was a turning point. It was, you know. It might have been just exhaustion. It might have been something else. But it was a turning point. And I started to clean up my life and look for someone who could explain this experience to me. Of course, I couldn't find anybody. And then, this is the, mo the most amazing part, is I started looking at the books. And one of the bookshops I went into was Watkins' book. And here I am today, talking to you, and they are the publisher. <laughs> they are connected with the Watkins books. Interesting how book that works. In, yeah, I found a book in there on Indian philosophy that explained, partly explained what's going on, but I obviously didn't understand it. And then I was, the, the guy in the bookshop suggested that I go and see, or read first, Krishnamurti. And I read Krishnamurti and I just knew that he was saying something really important. I knew he was speaking the truth, but I just didn't understand what he was saying. So I jumped on a plane and I went to see him. And I did actually get a one-on-one -on -one meeting with him. You jumped on a plane. Was it as simple as that? Or was the, was the need, you know, so great was that you had this compulsion? I had compulsion, but I was desperate, and I had never thought there was, I never knew there was such a man. Uh, you remember, in, in those days, I mean, you know, in, in my scene, no one knew about any of this. My friends would never talk about this stuff. They thought I was a bit strange. And, but to find someone like Krishnamurti was immense. And I just, I just had to go and see him. I didn't know I was going to get a one-on-one -on -one meeting with him, and I explained what happened in the book, but I, I went there, and I, I bumped into him on my way in there and asked him if I could have a one-on-one -on -one meeting. And he, he told me, yes, sir, please just make an appointment with my secretary. It was a big turning point, that one-on-one that -on -one meeting with him. He told you that there was no path to freedom. <laughs> yes. How did you respond to that? <laughs> For two days, I believe, I, w I was with him. I was with him all the way. When I left that room, I was on fire. I mean, I, I went in with questions. I went in with one question, actually. I, and um, I didn't say anything for I, most of the meeting. And then I asked him about this experience that I had in the nightclub. And he told me, sir, he held my hand and he said, sir, what you're looking for? is not an experience as such. He was begging me not to look an experience. And, and I got it in that moment. It was in this room. Everything that I'd ever wanted was just in this room. When I left the room, it stayed with me for a, a couple of days. And then it, it, it left. And then, of course, the, the long journey starts to find it again. Did you feel as if you'd, you know, reached some kind of pinnacle and then been dropped? For two days, it was, I was everything that I've always wanted to be for those two days. You know, it's happened to many people. Um, and then, like I say, it, was sort of, it, it couldn't have been real. It couldn't have been real because it never stayed. It was temporary. The, the, the definition of reality is something that, that, that doesn't change. And it wasn't until I met Rudra and many teachers after Rudra that I, I come to understand this, that the reality, it, it isn't reality if it changes. Well, 
tell me about, I mean, he said to you, uh, don't look for experiences. You won't find anything through experiences. And yet it was, you know, a sequence of experiences that led you to him. It was, it was, and, and I'm not saying there's not a journey, but once, once one sees what this is, then it's never not been there. It's always been there. It's just, it's just the very last place we look, the very last. You know, the self-inquiry starts with the separation with the self, and it looks to see if it's true, and that's what I was told to do. Look to see if it's true. Is there such a thing? as an inside self and an outside world. And I looked and I went to, and I, I couldn't make any sense of it. And then Rudra opened this up. But just the recogn you know, it, you know, just recognizing your true nature is not enough. It's about the, the realignment of your thoughts and feelings and perceptions into this. But to answer so, your question about ex go on. No, carry on, please. I've lost the train of thought on that. I'm talking about experiences leading you to him. Yes. I don't know how it happened, but there, you know, I mean, there I was. Anything can show up. You know, anything. I'm talking on the radio now with you. I, I don't know how this happened. It would have been impossible a few years ago. Walking into Wood, Watkins Bookshop, great experience. It was impossible for it for them to be publishers, the only publisher that I went to. So I don't, I mean, anything can show up. This, that is real. But it's temporary. Experiences are in time, but they're temporary. Tell me about time. Time is where I lived for most of my life. And time, as, be, as Chris Murray would say, is becoming. Becoming was my MO. I was always becoming. That is no longer here now. I, I don't feel a sense of next. I don't feel a sense of becoming. It's just a just normal state. I mean, I use time, you know, to, to I have to phone at the right time and to talk to you, and I have to meet Gaia at the right time, and I have to make arrangements in time. But psychological time it is no longer a problem for me. I, I don't I know that. I, actually made, sorry. I was going to say, I don't know that I know what that means. But not becoming. Yeah. I mean, I understand about time. I understand about moments because I had some the other day when you and I were speaking where my mind was blank and I just was, you know, I can't say it more eloquently than that, you know, for several moments. Good, yeah. I was, I guess you would say that I'm out of time, but I still don't understand exactly what that means and how one can hold on to that. Well, we have to, you know, go into the self inquiry and look at how we live now. I mean, mind, I'm not talking about finding anything in the mind. And what I mean by mind, I mean thought. I'm not talking about thought. Thought is time. If you have a thought now, it's, it's based on time. I must do this, I should do that, I will do this. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about something that is not of time. And the inquiry starts by looking to see if, like I said earlier, if there is such a thing is separate me inside this so-called body and an outside world, or if there's a separate me between anything you can hear or see or taste or touch or feel. So we live in separation, and in that separation is time. I am here, and in the future, I will be there. I will be enlightened, or I will be, I'll get a better job, or I'll whatever it is. That is the, the becoming that I'm talking about. There's a sense that there's a next, next. This is not it. That's what I mean by time. So when one is resting in it, in those moments, 
what happens to the rest of the world. It's not a concern anymore of what happens in the rest of the world. You know, we use so much energy going out into the world and doing what we do. When we rest in these moments, where is the world? Well, if I ask you now, where is the world? Then you have to go to thought, and it's useful, and explain about your world and what we can do about it. But where is it if I ask you now? You have to go, where would you go if I asked you? You have to go into knowledge. And knowledge, again, is time. Useful. Useful and brilliant. But it's, it's not a, that mind is not a place that I'd like to live. It's useful, but it's not a great place to live in the mind. And yet, in order to exist, we have to, we have to go there. We have to take care of things. We have to, you know, take care of our bodily needs, our financial needs, our family needs. Um, you know, all of the things that we have going on around us that we participate in. Do you think that would end if we, if we, if we rested in this present? Momentarily. If, but it wouldn't really, it wouldn't, because things get done in this, from this present, and with a lot more energy. You know, we're burnt out trying to do all the things, juggling and spinning plates, all the things that you've just mentioned. It burns us out. We don't have any energy. When it comes to doing these things now, for me, I have energy to do. It's not used in conflict. I must, in time... Time again is in conflict. Time is conflict, psychological time. It's conflict. It sounds to me, you know, like this is one of those things that until you actually experience it, you, you, you spend an awful lot of time trying to grasp it. We'll come back to this after the break, Ray. You're listening to What Is Going On. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and tonight I'm speaking with British author, teacher, and speaker on non-duality, Ray Brooks whose latest book, The Shadow That Seeks the Sun, tells the story of how, after decades of searching, Ray found joy, love, and answers on the sacred river Ganges. We'll be back with more. The future of Internet radio is here. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Hello, this is Dr. Donise Warden, and I'm excited to tell you about homeopathic injections from Hevert Pharmaceuticals. I utilize them in my practice, for pain, inflammation, depression, and other medical conditions. I'm achieving excellent results, and I've seen no adverse reactions. I encourage you to explore these novel treatments. Call Hever today at 855-387-6466 to find a practitioner in your area to administer these FDA-registered medications. 855-387-6466. Change and growth are part of natural life, and also part of your spiritual life. Everyone needs support and guidance, especially during life passages. Upgrade yourself with the Ohm Times Experts program. With Ohm Times Experts, you have access to the best intuitive coaches, spiritual teachers, counselors, astrologists, and oracles. Our team was carefully selected so you can trust. Find out more at experts.ohmtimes.com. More than 24 million Americans have an autoimmune disorder, and that number continues to grow. I'm Sharon Saylor, and I'm one of those 24 million. To put that number in perspective, cancer affects about 9 million and heart disease up to 22 million. That's why I've brought together top experts and those thriving regardless of their diagnosis to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information. Join me, Sharon Saylor, Friday night, 7 p.m. Eastern, for the Autoimmune Hour on Life Interrupted Radio to find out how to live your life uninterrupted. My name is Meera Batra, and this is How I Live United. Many families have come to America for a better life. I advocate for these families with United Way. United Way empowers them to see opportunities available. We help them get involved with their kids, schools, and network within the community. My name is Meera Batra. I help families see opportunity and succeed. I don't just wear the shirt. I live it. Give, advocate, volunteer. Live United. Go to liveunited.org. Brought to you by United Way and the Ad Council. 
Welcome back. Ray Brooks, before we get caught up in asking some of the questions and finding some of the answers to that I have and have had yeah. ever since I read your book, I want to just go back a little bit and talk about how this book came about and a bit more of your journey. Um, oh, the Shadow... Sense. The Shadow That Seeks the Sun is a very intriguing title. What does it mean? It means um, a shadow. This is what I, I, I'm, I was that shadow in the title. The shadow is a metaphor for a false self that looks for, for its true nature, for its true self. A shadow that's seeking the light, which is impossible because the, the light will always diminish it. Mm. Okay, so tell us how this book came about? Okay. You know, I'd often, when I came back from Rudra and I studied a lot, and I'd always go for the walk, and it would always come up, I should write a book about this, I should write about my adventures with my wife Diane, who was the co-author of this book. I should write about my adventures and, and explain this, try and explain this understanding that kept on coming up, and I wasn't sure how to go about it, but Diane and I, we wrote the stories first, and then I left it for maybe two years, and then I started, it came to me on a walk one day, I can write these talks, and um, I wrote all the talks, and Diane helped me with the adventures that, that the talks weave through. It was something I had no control over. The idea, it just of writing, it just kept coming up, and I'd, I'd go on my quiet walks, and it just kept coming up. And, we, and Diane and I, we decided we'd publish it, we'd self-publish it, and sell some on the web, try and get some money back, because it cost quite a bit of money to, to publish it. And then we gave out free copies. One of those free copies I sent to a, a, a lad in um, Newcastle, my hometown, who was interested in the arts. And he wrote back, he loved the book, he wrote back to me, he said, you've got to get in touch with a woman called Paula Marvelli. And she has a, a website called the Culturium. So I did that, and Paula asked, I wrote a blog for her, and she asked me, she liked it, and she asked me to, she asked me to get in touch with a, a man called Michael Mann. I don't know if you've heard of him, he's a... Oh, I know iconic. Michael very well, yes. Mm. He is an iconic publisher. I mean, mm -hmm. we really, we're really thrilled. That was one of the best things that's happened to the book because I sent the book to him, and within 15 days, I mean, this is not heard of in a publishing book. Within 15 days, he wrote back an email saying, Ray, I love your book, and I want to try and publish it. And I looked him up on the, e on the YouTube, and I thought, well, he, doesn't, he won't have to try too hard because he's, he's so well-known. But apparently he did. He has, you have to sell these things to a board. And that's how that came about. But it was strange. when He must have read the book. And on the first, in the first chapter, it mentions Watkins' book. I mean, it must, it must have, he must have been thrilled with that. <laughs> you know, I mean, having read the book, and our listeners won't have any idea, um, but having read the book, uh, it truly is... Um, a bit of a standout in my experience because you have these nine conversations with Rudra and we'll get to Rudra in a moment and interspersed throughout you also have um, lots of stories of the humorous encounters that you had with lots of colourful characters in Rishikesh. Oh, yeah. I, um, I love those characters, yeah. And there's something about the juxtaposition of those quiet you know, very in the moment conversations with Rudra and these strange adventures that you had where things would just happen. You know, you just meet people or things just happen to happen yeah. around you that give, you know, this enormous colour um, and background. And and they also, I mean, again, there's a juxtaposition between you get the feel for the Ganges, you get the feel, you know, the smell of the river, the people, the way they're living, the poverty, the colour. And then you have these little oases in time where you're sitting with Rudra and um, it together they they just create this wonderful, wonderful 
ambiance, you know, for for the reader to delve into. So tell us a little bit about how you came to meet Rudra. Well, I was on a ferry one day and we were crossing from Manikareti, which is in Rishikesh, to the other side of the Ganges, which is called Swagashra. And on the way across, the, there were some sadhus on there, which are holy men, were on there, and they were um, blessing themselves and chanting and throwing water into the boat. And I was sitting next to a guy, and he kept splashing me with water. And, um, and some of it went in my mouth, and uh, or nearly went in my mouth, and, and Rudra laughed. He was sitting opposite me and uh, laughed and said, um, you better be careful. Um, and it went, it went, I met him like that. I met him on the ferry. And the next day, I've forgotten all about it. I thought I was going to speak to him as soon as we got off the ferry. I really wanted to talk to this guy. Really felt, he really he looked like he, he was interesting. But he just disappeared. So I just talked to the ferry man and forgot all about it. But the next day, I saw him sitting on the ghats, the banks of the river Ganges, on the Manikareti side. And um, I, I struck up a conversation with him. And he, asked, he, he said it was getting hot there, and he usually moves down the ghats and sits in a cooler place. And he asked me, to, I walked with him, I, asked, I was going that way, and I said, can I walk with you? And he said, yes. And he asked me some questions, and he asked me about my, why I was in India, and was I studying, and I, I told him I was studying um, flute, and I was also interested in Eastern philosophy and their religion. And he, he challenged me there and then, and the, 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 I was shocked, you know. He, he challenged all my beliefs there and then, and that was the beginning of the talks. I asked if I could see him again, and he said yes. How long ago was this? It was in 2007, and Rudra died in 2009. So, you I'm had. In touch with his daughter. Hmm. You had many, many years then after leaving London, after meeting your wife Diane, having lots of travels. You had many experiences, much studying along the way. By the time you re met Rudra, you still hadn't regained that. I'll call it an experience, even though we're not supposed yeah. to have them. But no, the experience no, no, that you had with experience. them. No, I'm going yeah. to use the word experience. This is all you know now is experience. Um, by the time Rudra came up and and the few teachers after him, I was onto something. But before that, I could talk about this. This that is. But I didn't understand it. I had the knowledge of it. Oh, I get I it, had, yeah. I had, I had great knowledge of it, and there were times when I was so happy and so joyful, but then I'd wake up metaphorically at 3 o'clock in the morning and think, my God, I'm talking to people, and I don't know, I, I don't have it. There's still something missing, and I hadn't touched this. I had only, I only had the knowledge of this, great knowledge of this. I don't know how I missed it. Once it's seen, it's, it's, it can't, you see, well, how could I miss that? That's I like... Ask you now, if I ask you now, are you aware? Your answer is, of course. Yes, are you aware? I mean, no one had ever asked me that. Are you aware? Where do you go? Where do you look? Where do you go when I say, are you aware? There's nowhere to go. But you don't go in the mind looking. No. No. You don't go in the mind looking. It's the only place. It's the only place, this place, really, where you can go where you don't need to use thought. Everything else, all our attention is always outward, using thought, looking, looking, searching. And thought is trying to find itself. It's the shadow that seeks the sun thought is trying to find a self. Self doesn't care. 
the self is, 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 is it's already free. It neither cares nor doesn't. So this is like um, knowing without having any need to know how you know. That's exactly right, you know. Again, thought wants to know everything. But once you, you know, when, when there's joy in your life, you never question it. When there's happiness, we never question it. We're just happy and full of joy. Thought doesn't come in and say, oh, why am I full of joy? Why am I full of happiness? It only comes in when there's misery, suffering. When there's a lack of. And, of course, thought creates the lack of. <laughs> this is brilliant. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> awareness knows no sense of lack. This awareness, this awareness that you are right now, knows no lack. We look everywhere for this, and yet it's so close. I mean, you heard all the cliches, like the fish looking for water, mm. you know, the waves looking for the ocean. You've heard all the cliches, but it is really... If I ask you, are you aware, it takes you, you can't use thought. Thought cannot go there. You st it stops you in your track. Thought cannot go there. It's so simple. That, it sounds so simple that people discredit it. it awareness is not a product of the mind. Mind is a product of awareness. And, and science hasn't even caught up with it. You know, our, our, sci our, our scientists, our philosophers, they've never found a mind. They've never found matter. And yet they say that consciousness, which is already there continuously. S yeah. <laughs> so at what point during those nine conversations with Rudra, did you achieve, attain this experience? And what was that like? You know, when I came away from Rudra, like I said earlier, it, pointing this out, like I've pointed it out now, this, this, your true nature is awareness. It no says no that's a good start. It knows no sense of life. When I came away from Rudra, I knew this true nature. I knew this placeless place. I, I was this placeless place. It was easy. It, it, was, it wasn't always. I was finding shortcuts to it. Shortcuts all the time when I left. Always finding a shortcut. Until I, you know, sometimes it would take me like an hour or two. What was he talking about? And then maybe a week later, maybe half an hour, but eventually I got it down to, to just, it was just, as soon as, as soon as someone said, who are you? Or are you, I was there, it was just there. It is, I couldn't believe that I'd missed it. And you know, people ask me, yeah, it's all right for you, but you know, what if I have, you know, a busy life, and three kids, and a job, and all the bills to pay, and that. But you always, I mean, this isn't a practice. You'll always find a moment to stop and ask yourself, am I aware? And when you, I mean, I fell in love with it. Well, I say it like that, but it's like the self. It falls in love with itself. You, you, you don't want to be anywhere else. And things get done. I've not done so much, and there's no doer in it. But, I mean, things get done. My bills get paid. I'm, my relationships are stronger, better. I've got more energy for things. It's not wasted in worrying about who am I, what am I. So are you saying that having this experience gives you an ability to, because it's always there, it's always underpinning everything, so everything else in life becomes that much easier? Absolutely, yeah. But I'm not saying that hardships can't show up, I said earlier. Anything can show up in this. Anything at all. It's not a, it's not a cure for, you know. I mean, it, it may realign the body, but if you have ailments now, they're not just suddenly going to go away. If they, if they, you know, if you have diseases now, you still got to go and see a doctor. But it does realign the body. It 
does give you more energy. In fact, since I've been talking to you, I haven't, I haven't a thought about my body. And now you me- I've mentioned body. Here it is. It's just a sensation. Mm. Are you saying that like awareness... Is awareness our true nature? I, the sense that I am, which is a mist, the sense that if I asked you, are you, you'd have to say, I mean, no one could deny that they are. Yeah, I am. You don't need thought. You do not need thought to go there, to be it. You can't know this. This is something you, you are. You can be it. If this is our true nature. This is, this shines, this shines, whatever so, this is, the nature is, this shines. So if what the is the difference, shines. tell me the difference between awareness, consciousness and existence. I use them. I, they're all the same. For me now, they're all of the same thing. If I could have used the word awareness, I could have used the word God, I could have used the word Brahman, I could have used the word consciousness. All I'm using is the word awareness. It's a difficult word. To, at first, I explain it in a different way in the book. I take longer. Um, because people have different beliefs about awareness. They have, you know, higher awareness, lower awareness, different states of awareness. I'm not talking about that. High states, low states, whatever, take place in something that is never not. Something that is always, something that is continuous. And that's not really the right word. Something that is always already. The sense that you shine, that the sense that you shine in the mind as I am creates this multitude of things. It shines in the mind and creates, creates this, this beautiful multitude of experience. But it, is, it is not separate from that. It's not separate from anything that comes to it. I'm going to hold you right there, eh? You're listening to What Is Going On. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and I'm speaking with British author, teacher, and speaker on non-duality, Ray Books, whose latest book, The Shadow That Seeks the Sun, tells the story of how, after decades of searching, he found joy, love, and answers on the sacred river Ganges. We'll be back with more after this break. The cutting edge of Conscious Radio, Old Times Radio. IOM FM. Hello, this is Dr. Donise Warden, and I'm excited to tell you about homeopathic injections from Hevert Pharmaceuticals. I utilize them in my practice for pain, inflammation, depression, and other medical conditions. I'm achieving excellent results, and I've seen no adverse reactions. I encourage you to explore these novel treatments. Call Hevert today at 855-387-6466 to find a practitioner in your area to administer these FDA-registered medications. 855-387-6466. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. Home Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single Ohm Times endeavor. Host your show with Ohm Times Radio Network. My name is Victor Furman. Some call me The Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern on Ohm Times Radio, and we'll explore these topics and so much more on Destination Unlimited. 
I am Fidel Nshombo. I was born in a city called Bukavu in the Congo. We were a loving family. And then, boom, everything that I had disappeared in a single day. People think that when you are a refugee and they recirculate to America and all your problems are done. They don't understand that that's the beginning of everything. I was not born a refugee. I was made one. It's time we welcome refugee families with open arms. Learn more at EmbraceRefugees.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Welcome back. Ray Brooks, if awareness is who and what we are, why do we lose that knowledge? Why do we get stuck in other belief systems? Why do we get stuck in belief systems? Why do we leave home and go out into the garden and then get lost and then go out into the desert and start looking for ourselves? Why do we leave home in the first place? Um, the way the way we have been brought up, our conditioning. We're always looking for home, no matter if it's through spirituality or through sex, drugs, drink, um, relationship, whatever it is out there in the world. We're always looking for home. Why we, the, the fact, I don't think it would help if we, if we knew why we left in the first place. It's, it's best to just know that we have left and it's not a stretch to find to come back. See, I want to use this word experience because it's me. Is there an experience in which there is no separation? There is. There is. There's no separation between me and the world or me and what we may term God. This is the experience. This is the experience of our true nature. And it's, 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 I mean, this is really, it's been tried. It's not out there. It cannot be found out there. And when you look inside, you find out that it's not inside either. Because everything appears in something that is not inside the body. Awareness. This body is appearing now, as I say body, as a sensation, a sense in awareness. I don't feel that I'm inside a body looking for a home. Thoughts arise in awareness and imagines that, that it is awareness. It's made out of awareness, but it isn't awareness. Everything is made out of awareness. We can change it to consciousness. Like everything is made out of, out of consciousness. So you talk about self-inquiry being the key you know, what questions can we ask ourselves? Well, self-inquiry, it does, it erodes the habits of the mind. So any questions to start with work, but to, to look and see if there is any separation in your experience. If you, first of all, taste, taste something and say, where do I start and where does the taste begin. Is there, are there any boundaries between the, me and the taste? Are there any boundaries? Or is it just taste? Is there just experience? We can do that with seeing, looking something. And am I here and are those trees over there? Is there, where do I start? And where do those trees begin? Is there any boundaries between here and there. Is there a here and there, or is there just seeing? Just seeing. And we can do this with taste, touch, feeling. I can I can grasp that when you talk about taste. The same with touch. Can you grasp it if I talk about if I talk about hearing? When you hear my voice, where do you start and where does my voice begin? Or is it just an experience that is appearing in consciousness as consciousness? Without thought coming up at first, without the story, it's just, you're just hearing this. And then a story comes up and says, oh, that sounds great, or that's rubbish. So we can go through all these senses, see, is there any separation? 
for me in seeing you know, this, yes. this is a great meditation this is this meditation is the, <laughs> is the dissolution of the sense of self this is the beginning there's one of the questions you can ask another question is to ask yourself am i aware and see where it takes you it might be difficult at first but it will take you to yourself it will take you to the sense of you just a simple sense of you it's in there now not in there but it's there now sense of just i am so how how do we stop the chatter that then comes up how do we stay with that and not get caught up in the mind again all this chatter all of it all of it, all the mind, everything appears in consciousness. All the world appears in consciousness. Once you see that where, where home is, it doesn't matter about the chatter. There's no need to stop thinking. You know, all these techniques to stop thinking and to stop the chatter and monkey mind. It doesn't matter. Let the monkey play. If, if, it, isn't get any, if it doesn't get any attention, it will soon or at least slow down. you find slower and slower. You'll get slower and slower chatter. And you'll not want to be in the chatter. You'll want to be home. Who doesn't want to be home? Everything appears in this as this. But what you are is independent of it. It's not separate, but it is independent. So if we can experience this and know this and hold this, what happens then? I mean, you've said that finding your true nature is not the end, it is the beginning. What is it the beginning of? The beginning of, I mean, today, if someone just real, oh, yeah, I know what he's talking about, and... They, they realized it. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't just stay with them. They'd have to. They'd have to do some more investigating and 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 some more meditation in that I am, to so that it percolates, so that it realigns the body, so that this moves moves into their problem, moves into their conflicts, it moves into their pains, it moves into the body, it moves out into the world. It's not going to happen just because you see your true nature. Your true nature is the beginning of a marvelous journey. It's not, I have not, it's not that I've finished. It's neither beginning or ending for me. It's, it's just, the, the wonder is still there. But if I want to then dive deeper, discover more, you know, continue that journey, then at some point I have to go into the mind. No, grace, and you've heard this before, grace will take you the rest of the journey. The mind can only take you out of I am because it is not real. It's not the real. It's a belief. You can believe in I am. Say, oh, yeah, I am. I am. I am aware. I am. But it's, it's not the same as experience of I am, which does not need thought. It does not need the mind. To go there and to stay there and let grace take you the rest of the journey. Because you come into be, you become interested in it. You want to go back to this sense of I am. You want to be there. You don't want to spend all your time in the chatter. You cut yourself in chatter and then oh you know where you, there's some way for you to stand for a while. At the moment, most people I meet, they don't have anywhere to stand. They're completely lost in the mind. And some of them are, I mean, they, they can talk about this. They can speak about it and tell people about it, but they haven't tasted it. You know, consciousness must be primary. It must be, it must be the reality. Because everything appears to it and disappears from it. it. Well, it arises and falls in it. But consciousness, there's never a time 
This is important. There's never a time when you're not consciousness. When you're in a dream, in a dream night, in a so-called nighttime dream, you're conscious. This consciousness is there. Sorry. In the waking state now, this all this around me that I'm looking at now is is appearing in consciousness. When you're asleep, consciousness is there. Sleep is appearing. The absence of of self is appearing. The absence of objects are appearing. You, you know your own absence. You know in the next day when you wake up that you've had a great sleep. We return back to our own completeness. With this, we t we, we 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 don't want to leave this uh, this our own completeness. Once it's tasted, it's an invitation to go back and experience this completeness again. That's what we're looking for in everything we do, whether it's buying a car or, as I said earlier, relationships or anything, drink. It's to find completeness. And what I'm saying here is it's not in any object. It's not in subject or object. Both appear in consciousness. What you are is what you what you are is what you've always been looking for. Now, I love that. That was something that I, that, that that really shook me when it, when it, when this dawned on me. And it was a dawning for me. It wasn't an explosion. It's one day I'm walking along and 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 it just came to me. Wow. I don't have the fear or the dread. I, I used to have dread when I when I was a young lad. It, it was dread that my grandmother would die and I'd be left alone. I have to go to London. I just noticed one day that it had gone, and fear had gone, and trying to please people had gone. I felt complete, but it didn't come in words. It just, oh, it just was a surprise, because it was, it's just like a natural state. It's just like not having a headache. I feel like my mind is becoming a bit of a labyrinth right now um, because I get what you are saying some of the time. I don't get it all of the time. And one of the things that, you know, occurs to me, there, there's a thought, is that how does you... Right. You know, how does one teach this? Because if you put it into a book, which you've done, you know, I have... I think about it as I'm reading your book. I'm thinking about what I'm reading. Uh, yes, I'm having, you know, experiences and I'm having physical understandings and awarenesses, etc. But I'm also thinking about it. I'm processing that information. Um, I'm asking myself the questions. Does this feel real to me? So, you know, we can't get rid of thought entirely. We can't be we completely... Don't have to. Thought is very useful. But we've got to see that it is random. It is not who we are. We're living our life through thought, and it is not who we are. We say, I am this, I am that. We never go back and say, well, what is this I? When we look, we see this I, and it's purity. It's, it's beautiful. And what you is know, this I? Is... is this I awareness? Is this I this oneness? I is consciousness shining. This is awareness shining. And is the realization of that? You'll see, you'll see that if you look, just look now, you'll see there's something there. If, am I aware? If you look, you see something that is shining, that is aware, that has always been there. Even when you were a kid, oh, wow, that was there. Ray, I'm aware that we've got probably not many seconds left before we have to close the program. I, I need to ask you one last question, I'm afraid. We probably could talk about this for hours. Um, is this awareness that you speak of, this experience of awareness, is this the meaning and the purpose to life? You know, when you have joy, you never ask for a meaning in life. When you're happy and in love, you never ask the meaning of life. We only ask the meaning of life when we're suffering. They, we, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you discover, when you recognize what you are, you don't need any meaning in life. It's full of, it's, it's, it's shining. It, 
doesn't need meaning. Only thought needs meaning. Thought needs meaning because it's on shaky ground, because it, it knows nothing. It knows nothing. It does not know awareness. Awareness knows it. And we're on, when awareness is onto it all the time. It's there. Awareness Ray Brooks, nothing. Yes. I'm going to have to leave it here. Um, this, this is a, you know, this conversation for me is a little bit of torture because I'm aware that in order to have this conversation, I have to be in thought or it feels like I have to be in thought. And that's, that's okay. not the place where I want to be when I'm having a conversation with you. <laughs> right. So there's the paradox. Suffice to say that I think if people read your book, they will have an experience of what I had um, reading the book and when I spoke to you earlier this week and we weren't caught up in time then. Ray Brooks, we sorry, to cut, <laughs> sorry to cut it short, but we have to leave it there. Thank you for joining oh, us thank today. You. Oh, thank you so much. Bye-bye. The, bye -bye. the Shadow That Seeks the bye. Sun is published by Watkins Publishing. For more information about Ray Brooks, visit his website at www.raybrooks.org. I encourage you, read the book. It really is an experience. That's it for this week. I'll be back next week with another edition of What Is Going On. Till then, it's goodbye from me.